morning, everyone. Uh, and morning to everybody watching online as well. Um, today marks the start of our Easter week, uh, if you can believe it. Um, and I hope you're all enjoying the roller coaster weather we've been having of hail and sun and rain and wind. Um, but as we come into Easter, we're going to be taking a small detour from our Ephesian series that uh, Mark and TJ have been taking us over uh, these last couple of weeks. And we're going to be looking um, uh, surrounding the uh, days leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and I really hope that we can engage in the life of the church over these next couple of weeks, because uh, during this time we get to celebrate and proclaim the central storyline of the Bible, which is Jesus coming, uh, his death and resurrection. Um, so this morning, we're looking at the triumphal entry, as it's recorded in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and the triumphal entry marks the beginning of this Easter season uh, for Jesus as he moves towards the cross. And in the Jewish calendar, uh, the triumphal entry is happening on the lead up to Passover, uh, a time where Israel celebrate rescue from slavery. Um, so as Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem, he is declaring that the king has come. Um, and we're going to look at this under three headings. Uh, heading number one is the identity of the king. Heading number two is the crowd welcome the king. And heading number three is the crowd have misunderstood the king. Uh, so just a little bit of background before we jump into our passage in Mark. Um, just to give you a little context to keep in mind as we read. Uh, I know this is a very familiar passage, uh, but we are diving right in with no groundwork. Uh, so... Um, in Israel's history so far, they've experienced exile, followed by a return to the land. Uh, and up until Jesus, there's been an extended quiet period since the announcement from the last prophets. Um, and the prophets had spoken about a chosen one, um, or Messiah in Hebrew. Uh, as Isaiah 42.1 says, uh, it talks about my servant or my chosen one. Um, and the prophets predict that this Messiah will reign as king from the line of David and will establish justice and righteousness. Uh, I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and it will be on the screen behind us. It says, uh, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Um, we're still in our Easter series. It's not Christmas. I know we speak about that a lot at Christmas, uh, but it's important context as we lead up to Easter. Um, so as we saw, the, the prophets have prophesied, prophesied about a chosen one, uh, but they also promise that the Lord will free Israel from oppression. Uh, in the very same chapter in Isaiah 9, but in verse 4, Isaiah promises freedom from oppression. Uh, so this is God speaking, uh, this is Isaiah, sorry, speaking that God will be acting on behalf of Israel. And he says in verse 4, For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor. So all in, the Jews were waiting on a Messiah who would reign on David's throne, but they were expecting the Messiah to come and deliver physical military victory. So they want them to kick out the Romans, basically. Uh, they misunderstood the Messiah's mission. They misunderstood what it meant to bring justice and righteousness without wiping out the very people who are waiting for it. They misunderstand that the oppressive yoke was much worse than the Romans, but was sin itself. So keep all of this in mind. This is what the first century Jew is thinking when Jesus enters Jerusalem. Uh, so look down with me at Mark chapter 11 and verses 1 to 10. And I'm just going to read it for us. It should be on the screen as well behind you. Uh, so it says, When they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back right away. So they went and found a coal outside in the street, tied by a door. 
They untied it, and some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They answered them just as Jesus had said. So they let them go. They brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. <coughs> Many people spread their clothes on the, ro clothes, clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Um, so our first point is the identity of the king. Um, I don't know if many of you have seen the procession of an important delegate before, uh, but it is quite a spectacle. Uh, me and Claire, when we were um, in New York last year, visiting family in the States, as we usually do, following which we had to remortgage our home, uh, we were there to do the usual tourist things. Uh, one afternoon, we took a walk over the Brooklyn Bridge, and as we were walking, we noticed these unmarked police vehicles uh, stop in the middle of the bridge, and they're blocking traffic just sitting there, and so we were wondering what's going on. And then these high-tech military helicopters fly over the top of us as well, uh, and they start circling one of the piers that we can see from the bridge. And at this point, we're really wondering what's going on. Uh, so we stayed to find out, and you can judge whether that was the most sensible decision or not. Uh, but down at the pier, uh, we see several people flown in, and there's this giant procession of vehicles that starts traveling from the pier towards us. And in the middle of the procession, there's a black limousine flying two American flags. And unmistakably, this is a person of importance. And it turns out that it was the president. Uh, this is the scene that we see here in Mark 11, the first century version of the motorcade. Uh, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on an overtly recognizable form of transport with a delegation of disciples proclaiming his arrival with singing in palm branches. So just as Joe Biden's arrival in New York communicated the president had arrived, Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem and the manner in which he arrived communicated that the king had come. The crowd under understood what Jesus was communicating and Luke records that the crowd explicitly shouted in his account, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. To us, it might be confusing. Why does the manner of Jesus' arrival communicate the king had come? Well, let's work through the narrative together. Um, the narrative begins in verse 1, and it records Jesus coming to Bethpage and Bethany. And you might remember that Bethany is the village where Lazarus and his sisters lived. TJ spoke about that during his I Am series. And it's very likely that Jesus is visiting Lazarus and his sisters. You may also remember that one of the principal reasons that the religious leaders were looking to put Jesus and Lazarus to death was because of Jesus' miraculous raising of Lazarus from the dead. And you, we see that in John chapter 12. I don't know if it's on the screen. But it reads, uh, Then a large crowd of the Jews learned he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests had decided to kill Lazarus also, because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. Uh, and then from Bethany, or Bethpage, the narrator follows Jesus' disciples going out to secure transport in verses 1 to 7 of our passage in Mark. Um, and it might seem strange that Mark spends such a significant amount of time detailing the disciples going and securing a donkey and bringing it back and Jesus then riding on it. Seven out of the ten verses, so two-thirds of this significant account in Jesus' life is taken up with these details. Um, and so I think we should be wondering why is this important? Well, just as the president's limo with its American flags clearly marks that as the president of the United States, the donkey clearly identifies Jesus as the king of Israel. This is a seal of his identity. Uh, and the crowd and the gospel writers recognize this. So how has the donkey become a seal of identity for Israel's king? Well, it's established in Old Testament prophecy. So turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 49, and we'll be looking at verses 8 to 12. It should be on the screens as well. Uh, the prophecy reads, uh, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the necks of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah is a lion. My son, you return from the kill. He crouches, he lies down like a lion or a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet 
until he whose right it comes and the obedience of the people belongs to him. He ties his donkey to a vine and the colt of his donkey to the choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. So Israel or Jacob at the end of his life is prophesying concerning his sons. And the verses that we just read was the prophecy concerning Judah. Uh, And this prophecy uh, is one of the earliest pictures we see of Israel's king. In verse 10 of our passage in Genesis, we find Jacob prophesying that Judah will be the king. It says the scepter will not depart from between his feet. And in verse 8, we see that Judah will be king over his brothers. Your father's sons will bow down to you, the prophecy says. So this is the king of Israel. Interestingly, even in this very early depiction of Israel's king, we see in verse 11 that his mode of transport will be a donkey. Verse 11 says, he ties his donkey to a vine and the colt of his donkey to the choice vine. On Easter week, as Jesus enters Jerusalem, he purposely chooses to ride a donkey because of what it communicates. Yet there's more to the prophecy. Uh, Think back to John 15, I am the true vine, which TJ mentioned earlier today. You might remember that we saw the Old Testament writers use vine imagery to describe Israel. So here in Jacob's prophecy, we see the donkey, which is a symbol of kingship, being tied to the choice vine, which is a symbol for the nation of Israel. So during his triumphal entry, we're witnessing the king Jesus tying his kingship to the people of Israel, to the choice vine. As he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus is declaring he is the king of Israel. So from the slightly more obscure Genesis prophecy, uh, we'll look at Zechariah, um, just in case you aren't convinced by the symbolism yet. Uh, Zechariah is pretty explicit. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And other gospel writers quote this as well uh, in their accounts. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey. So the connection is obvious. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he is fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah in a very visual way. As Jesus does so, the imagery from Zechariah is evoked in the minds of the crowd. Jesus is the king. If you read the whole of Zechariah chapter 9, you would read the Lord pronouncing judgment on Israel's surrounding enemies, and you would see the Lord portrayed as a conquering warrior. Yet, as we just read in verse 9, in the midst of this warfare, we see Israel's king, Israel's coming king, and he's unexpected. He's described as humble, riding on a donkey, or more specifically, the foal of a donkey. And wouldn't we expect to see descriptions of like a mighty conquering warrior king coming into Jerusalem? Yet, this is the unexpected description we're given in the midst of Zechariah's prophecy. But despite that, we're told that the king is both righteous and victorious. And as Zechariah verse 10 says, he proclaims peace to the nations. So true to prophecy, we see Jesus' victory a few days later. And true to prophecy, Jesus achieves it in the most unexpected yet far better way as he dies for the people. Um, Think back to the passage in Isaiah 9 that we read at the start. Zechariah chapter 9 reveals a similar tension to Isaiah. The Lord removing the yoke of oppression, yet doing so through the Prince of Peace. Prophecy not only determines that the King of Israel will come from the tribe of Judah, but it also reveals that he'll come from the line of David. To quote Isaiah 9 again, verse 7 says, He will reign on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. So as Jesus announces his his identity through his triumphal entry, the crowd see him as the Messiah. This is why in verse 10 of our passage in Mark 11, they shout with joy, blessed is the kingdom of our father David. They have recognized the motorcade and they're excited for for what they expect the king to do for Israel. There is, however, a curious detail in Mark's account found in verse 2. It says, You will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. 
At the end of David's life, when the throne is being passed to Solomon, Adonijah, Solomon's brother, attempts to steal the throne from him. In response, David engages in a very public coronation of Solomon. And part of the coronation involved Solomon riding on David's donkey or mule uh, in 1 Kings um, 1.33. It says, the king said to them, take my servants with you. Have my son Solomon ride on my own mule. Adonijah is then told later on about Solomon's coronation and the fact that Solomon was riding on David's mule was an important detail. In verse 44, it says, and they have had him ride on the king's mule. David had Solomon ride his mule because it signified Solomon was an extension of David's reign and that Solomon was approved by David. Solomon would look like David as he rode his mule. So I think that the uh, detail in Mark 11 verses 2 signifies that although Jesus was the promised king from the line of David, he was also something unique. He was not a king in the likeness of anyone before him and he was not continuing anyone else's reign. He was bringing something that was utterly unique, the nature of which the crowd in the coming days would fail to grasp. But why does the crowd fail to understand Jesus? Why will, in just a few days' time, these people shout for his murder? The Jews knew the scriptures better than anyone, and they were the ones who had been entrusted with the oracles of God. So it might seem strange that they didn't understand why Jesus had come. Well, the reason that they didn't understand was because it hadn't been revealed to them. And I think this serves as a warning to us that separated from God, without relationship with him, depending on just um, knowledge and understanding and uh, religious tradition, we will misunderstand God and inevitably reject him. So we need constant reminding that religious adherence isn't enough and it's all about relationship. So our second point, the crowd welcomes the king. Um, At this point in the narrative, though, in the triumphal entry, Jesus still fits the crowd's expectations, and so they're still excited to welcome him, even if their motives are misplaced. Um, Their response is ironically appropriate. So look down at verses 9 and 10 uh, of Mark 11. They shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Uh, This is actually an extract from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, uh, which reads, Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. Uh, So you should see them both on the screens behind us compared. Uh, Hosanna, which you see in verse 9 of our passage, is a transliteration of the Hebrew phrase, Hoshiana which can be understood as a plea for salvation or deliverance with hushia meaning save and na in the context is translated as like an imperative plea. Uh, So please save. Um, The clear quote from the crowd again in verse nine of Mark following Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord corresponds then to verse 26 of Psalm 118. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. So let's just take a moment to reflect on what the, lo- what the crowd is communicating as they shout in verse 9. They connect the triumphal entry to Psalm 118, and in doing so, enrich our understanding of the occasion. Psalm 118 is a hymn of thanksgiving and praise often recited during Passover celebrations, commemorating God's faithfulness and deliverance. Uh, and as we've noted, verse 25, which includes the phrase, Hushiana, as a plea for salvation, And verse 26 speaks of the one who comes in the name of the Lord, so evoking these messianic overtones. So by quoting from Psalm 118, the crowd at the triumphal entry aligns Jesus with the prophetic expectations of the Messiah, the one who brings salvation and fulfills God's promises. The use of this psalm during Passover adds layers of meaning. As Passover commemorates the the liberation of Israelites from bondage in Egypt, yet is anticipating a greater deliverance through the promised Messiah. So when we consider that all of this is happening just days before the Passover celebration, the perfection and power of God's plans really are brought into focus. Uh, Further, some scholars argue that this is actually taking place on the Monday, not on the Sunday as is traditionally expected. Uh, And the timings in Mark's gospel in particular are well-structured and allow for that. 
And if this is the case, Jesus' triumphal entry would be happening on the 10th day of the first month in the Jewish calendar, with Passover happening on Friday, which is the 14th day of the month. The 10th day is the day that the Jews would traditionally select their Passover lamb for sacrifice. And as Jesus publicly declares his identity, he is sealing his fate and in essence being selected as the Passover lamb. So think about that. That one awesome God we serve, that no detail is out with his control. Just before we move on from Psalm 118, I can't help but read verses 19 to 24 from that psalm. This is what Jesus has done for us. So as I read it, just take some time to thank God for the coming of Jesus. Open the gates of righteousness for me. I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. The the righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord. It is wondrous in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus came to open the gates of righteousness and has allowed us to walk through them. The crowd continues to shout in Mark 11. Verse 10, we, we, they're quoted as shouting, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest, he- in, in the highest heaven. <laughs> the crowd also connect Jesus to messianic prophecy regarding the Davidic kingdom. They declare him to be the promised king, ushering in the promised kingdom. And again, think back to Isaiah 9. It says, He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now and forevermore. So just as the connection to Psalm 118 is good news, so too is the connection to Davidic prophecy. This king, who will declare peace to the nations, will reign forever with justice and righteousness. And this is King Jesus. This is how he will reign. And this moves us on to our last point, The crowd misunderstand the king. Um, It is on this point in the coming days that Jesus will lose the crowd. They misunderstand the promised kingdom of God and they reject its coming king. They can't imagine what it will take to establish justice and righteousness in his kingdom. Peter, one of his, Jesus' closest disciples, even, recognize, even after recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, rebukes him for how he intends to reign, which is dying to establish justice and righteousness for his people. The crowds interpret prophecy concerning Jesus as physical security from their enemies. They expect a kingdom like the one Solomon inherits in 1 Kings. But, but God's plan is so much bigger. God is bringing everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. This is why Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world and that this is why he hadn't come with physical force. It would be a mistake, however, to think that the problems the crowd had with Jesus are isolated to the first century. You might read these accounts and think, that there's no danger that we would respond this way. It seems so extreme to be one minute exalting Jesus like we read and then the next shouting for his death. Only extreme religious bigotry and jealousy from the religious leaders would lead to this. But I need to warn my own heart as well as yours that there is very real danger. I know from my own experience that one minute my heart is on fire with worship for God and the next it can be cold toward him, and in some cases tempted to actively rejecting him in thought and deed. And why do we respond this way? Why did the crowd move from one extreme to the other within a matter of days? Well, I think the heart of the matter is idolatry. We know that the crowds eventually reject Jesus, and on a surface level, this is because he fails to meet their expectations. But what did their expectations reveal about their heart? What were they worshipping? Well, firstly, they were hoping to see miracles and experience physical healing like they witnessed with Lazarus. And they wanted Jesus to remove the physical oppression that they experienced from their oppressors. So they were worshipping comfort. And secondly, 
They wanted God to reinstate their political power and influence with a physical kingdom. They were worshipping pride and status. And I mean, there's probably a number of other things that they're worshipping, but those are two obvious ones. In essence, the crowd had made an idol of the promised Messiah. They had created a God of their own imagination, which was designed to satisfy their own desires. And so when God did come, although they accepted him with joy at first, they eventually reject him because he failed to meet their expectations. They didn't know God and so weren't excited by his promises. As I said, this danger is real for us too. So often the temptation to replace God with something that we think will satisfy our desires presents itself. And this is always on our own terms. We think we need what we are willing, we think what we need uh, and we determine what we're willing to sacrifice in order to get it. And in those moments we have a choice to make to either cling to God or to reject him. And my question then is to everybody and to myself, what are we tempted to idolize? And this would be different for everybody, family, um, media, success. Um, but all these things, they reveal something about our character. And I think recognizing what we are tempted to idolize will help us reject these idols when they present themselves. And this can change with seasons of life. And so I think we need to be constantly evaluating ourselves and evaluating our hearts. For example, I, at the moment, I'm tempted to idolize success and work. I know it and I feel it. Uh, I see it crouching at the door. Uh, the heart issue is likely temptation to achieve pride and status. And this is how it's currently presenting itself. But how do I fight this temptation? Uh, in the same way that each of us do. And it's through a healthy understanding of God as he reveals himself in his word and by building personal connection and dependence through prayer. So when faced with this temptation recently, as my work situation changed, I prayed. I asked God for wisdom and understanding to see his will in the situation. And I asked that independent of the practical outcome, I would recognize God's promises far outweigh any outcome that I desired asking that I would recognize God's kingdom as the pearl of great value worth selling everything to obtain. And remember, we're not in this fight on our own. God has given us the church. So use that resource, church family. Use one another. Let each other build you up. God gives us the church as a gift. Um, God tells us that his promises are far better than any desires we may conceive apart from him and all else leaves us wanting and dissatisfied. As we chase our own desires, we create a God of our imagination, just like the first century Jews did. And as Christians, we can do the exact same thing. We can build a picture of God that is not found in scripture, but rather by our own understanding or even influenced by the world. As Christians, it is our responsibility to accurately represent Christ in the world. As the church it is our responsibility to act as ac accurate representatives of Christ's body. In doing so, we offer the world something of great value. So DBC, this Easter season, guard yourselves against idolatry and accurately represent him before a watching world. That's my message to you this morning. Uh, I'm just going to pray for us based on all of this. Um, I pray that we give glory to God uh, and Jesus for everything that he's done in coming, for that incredible detail in him coming. I mean, it's amazing to think. Uh, and also pray against idolatry, pray against the temptation to build gods of our own imagination and to go after them because they fulfill our desires. Uh, and also pray that um, as we come into this Easter season that we would be effective on mission, that we would engage with, with those surrounding us, that we would be um, accurate representations of Christ. Uh, so I'm just going to take a moment to, to pray just now. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for your uh, message this morning. Thank you for your word in Mark. Uh, thank you for your coming, Jesus, and thank you for all the details that surround it. Thank you for the nature of your coming. Thank you that there had been thousands of years of prophecy before you came and that in each detail you fulfill every aspect of that prophecy. And as we look back on that, help us to marvel at that detail. Help us to marvel at you uh, because, God, you are the only one who could have orchestrated all these things. This isn't man-made. Uh, this is only by your design. 
Um, so, Jesus, thank you for your coming. Thank you that you are the king. Thank you that you reign with justice and righteousness. Uh, and thank you that you have established justice and righteousness for us through your death and resurrection. Lord, help us to hold on to this. Help us to make that the um, apple of our eyes, Lord. Help us not to go after other things, making man-made gods. Uh, but Lord, keep our hearts firmly fixed on you, knowing that you and your kingdom is the pearl of great value. Uh, Lord, help us as well this Easter season to be accurate representations of you, Jesus, and of your kingdom. Uh, help us to... Um, reach our surrounding community with the gospel um, and as we speak and as we act that people would see you Christ. Uh, Lord thank you for your church, thank you for the encouragement that it is and the strength that it gives each of us believers. Uh, I pray all of this in Jesus name.